What's going on, y'all? KM Best here. Let's talk about the new spotlight caches for the upcoming Thunderbolt season in Marvel Snap. The first spotlight cache of the month starts with Red Hulk, a 611 that gets plus four when your opponent has unspent energy. Now, the natural inclination with this card is twofold. First, people look at it and they say, oh, that's a high evolutionary counter, which it probably is. Second, people look at it and they say, oh, is that just a large enough guy that I'm interested in running it anyway? Now, the interesting thing for me here is if in hand or in play as the clause, this gives it a sort of reverse high Evo Hulk type effect, which is you want it in your hand early, but only if your opponent is going to be skipping those early turns. Now, I will say there are a lot of decks in the current metagame that are willing to skip those early turns. A lot of those combo decks are those kind of decks. A deck like Phoenix Force very often skipping at least turn one. A deck like Hela very often skipping one and two some of the time. Living Tribunal, also one of those kind of situations. However, the interesting thing about those decks is that those are not the exact matchups that you want a card like this in. You want a card like this against High Evolutionary, because High Evolutionary is still trying to like lock you out of one location and then play one big guy. And if you have a bigger guy, you know, you're going to beat him. But I'm not sure this has wider metagame implications than that as a counter card. Where this card might actually shine is as a big guy in its own right. So, for example, this is a Hella card. This probably, in my opinion, is going to replace Giganto in a lot of Hella decks. That's a baseline thing it probably will do. It has a home. It also could end up being a very good lockdown card, the kind of deck that was lacking like a really big threat to play super tall the way that High Evo did, which gave High Evo an advantage in being a lockdown deck. But now lockdown has not just Doctor Doom, but also a way to go super tall in one lane that could potentially replace Eliath as Eliath's effectiveness has fallen off in that deck because other decks are better at getting priority. This could be a lockdown card. This could be a hella card. I can see it there. There are other homes that this card could go in, but those are much more competitive ones. So for example, this could be a Hope Summers mid-range card. But the issue there is most Hope Summers mid-range decks, whether they're built around the move effect or whether they're built around doing something extremely powerful, just playing Hope Summers Gladiator Miss Marvel stuff, tend to be running two six drops already, Dr. Doom and Magneto. And I think it's likely to me that in those kind of decks, those cards are better, but in something that is more focused around optimizing for Red Hulk being very large, it could be a better option, such as in a lockdown style deck. Now, the other place that this deck, this card could go is in Thanos, right? Like Thanos is a potential deck that runs a lot of really big sixes. This guy is actually competitive with Blob on size. It could be a blob replacement. It could be a blob uh, adjacent card, right? Where you just like run it and like your blob just because you run a bigger card, you get bigger. The issue is Thanos itself has less spots for six drops now because of the way the metagame has been trending. It's more of a Cull Obsidian Mockingbird deck than it is a we run five six drops deck. And it still has to compete with at least Magneto for those spots. I think what will determine whether or not this card ends up being good is whether or not it makes it into the latter two types of decks or if it makes one of the former two types of decks truly elite. I think that's what you should look for when evaluating this card. If you think it's going to do either of those two things, it'll be a good pickup. If it ends up just being a like, like let's make Lockdown slightly higher tier two, let's make Hella slightly better, but it doesn't really make it into the decks that are really making the cut at the top of tier one. It might be a miss. We'll have to see how things shake out. This is a card with the potential to be elite, but without knowing how it'll shake out and with strong competition at the six drop slot, I'm interested to see what ends up happening. Alongside Red Hulk in the caches is Sebastian Shaw first. And Sebastian Shaw is a card that is only played in Silver Surfer and you should only get if you plan on playing Silver Surfer. Now, there has been some movement towards Surfer being good again. I've seen very good players like Yo Woody and Tanjo playing Silver Surfer in the current metagame. However, there's no guarantee that this will remain true. I would say that Sebastian Shaw is a fairly important part of those decks. He is a good card in those decks. He is a card that you like to see when you play those decks, but he does not have a lot of utility outside of that role. And what that means is unless you are playing Silver Surfer and unless Silver Surfer is good at the time you're opening these caches and you plan on playing it, 
this guy is not a draw. Next up is Echo, a 1-2 with the ability to remove the ongoing abilities from cards that are played after her and across from her. Now, the issue that Echo has is she is very specific. She is a card that goes in specific decks at specific times in specific metagames, and for the most part has never been in either the best or the second best or the third best deck in a metagame. She is a tech card that is constantly looking for a home. There are often matchups in a given meta that you would benefit from including Echo in your deck in. However, those matchups are rarely common enough that you actually end up wanting to use one of your very precious card slots on this card. Sometimes I have seen good players play this. I personally have played it very rarely. I think the only place it has a really stable home is a deck like Cerebro 2, and I do not think that that should be the kind of thing that you are opening Spotlight Caches for, given their rarity and how hard they are to replace. Next up is U.S. Agent, a 2-3 with an ongoing ability that gives 4, 5, and 6 cost cards at his location minus 3 power. Now, I have one pitch for how this card might be good. To me, it reads as a combination enabler slash payoff for a Moon Girl She-Hulk High Evo Abomination deck. Now, that deck has very rarely been super elite, but there have been like players, Get Wrecked, and What Am I, to name a few, who are good players who have been playing it, but I would call it an off-meta option that this card could juice up. Because, A, if you play it early, it is helping you by A, being big, meaning you don't have as much to lose by skipping a turn, and B, making your evolved abomination cheaper, hopefully, right? Like you hit a four drop with this, this makes it like minus three, that matters, right? It's a little hard to land, but just having it there is a, a good threat to leverage against your opponent. And as a payoff, this is actually a card that is very fine to Moon Girl, right? Because you imagine something along the lines of playing, you know, two of these and two one-cost She-Hulks on the final turn of the game. If this hits one four-cost card, it's a 2-6. If this hits two four-plus-cost cards, it is a 2-9. Playing, you know, two two-nines and two one-tens is a very compelling final turn of the game. However, that deck has two extremely potent counters. The first is, of course, Luke Cage, which is a kind of a counter to this guy in, in, in and of itself, where it's just like, oh, I invested a, a whole spotlight cache in this, a whole four spotlight caches in this, maybe, and I got out a card that instantly dies to Luke Cage. Or, alternatively, uh, Mobius and Mobius actually seems to hurt the deck and that's going to be like the more salient tech card, I think, because it's like you're only ever playing this in, you know, She-Hulk Abomination type stuff, maybe in like Sarah type stuff as a 2-6 or a 2-9, right? And those are decks that are very highly reliant on those discounts and very weak to something like Mobius. And I'm not sure where else this guy really makes it unless he is just, you know, I am a good two drop and you play me for whatever reason. I think he also very likely, to me at least, goes in Cerebro 3, in as much as that's a thing, this is a card that is only impacting your opponents in a deck like this, because that deck is really not invested in playing expensive cards, with the possible exception of stuff like Valkyrie and Shang-Chi, you are very well able to manage that and keep it as a thing that is only negatively impacting your opponents, and that deck is not super invested in card quality, I think it could probably reasonably go there. I don't find it overly compelling, but I am interested in just how good this plays, because this is a card that I feel like could play a lot better than it reads. This reads kind of eh, but if you're actually playing a 2-6 most of the time, that's one of the best two drops in the game. And I think that there is a chance that this just ends up being a staple good two drop, and that's what you should look out for in the week of US Agent, you should look and see how people are using it. Is it just a combo card? Is it getting two murdered by Luke Cage? Or is this actually just a 2-6 that you can just put in whatever deck you want? Mirage is a good card, but runs into the issue of there being a lot of competition for what she does, including some competition coming later this month. Mirage is often played in Loki, but there is competition in the form of both Cable and Sentinel, which are free cards. Some of the time, Mirage has ended up better. Other times, Cable and, yes, even Sentinel have ended up as the two-drop of choice in Loki decks. Now, this is yeah, kind of is what it is, right? Like, that's just how it is. It's a, like, minor upgrade some of the time, a minor downgrade some of the rest of the time. 
Not a compelling reason to open caches, but it is a good card, and some of the time you're going to be like, oh, I really wish I had Mirage instead of this cable. That will happen. I think it's probably happened maybe like a couple months out of the year where it's like, oh, you know, Mirage is the right call right now. I need to be playing Mirage instead of Cable or Sentinel. It is an actual downgrade. So having this in your arsenal isn't bad, but I would consider it more like a throw-in freebie than it is anything along the lines of something that is something you should be opening caches for necessarily. People make a lot of noise about Shang-Chi and Eliath and their very high play rates, but no one complains about Jeff and his nearly equally, if not higher, play rate. Jeff is perhaps the most played card in the entirety of Marvel Snap, for his entire existence, as far as I've been able to tell, on untapped.gg, anywhere between 25 and 50% of decks are playing Jeff, and that is uh, plainly ridiculous, and I think that that demonstrates just how useful this card is to have in your collection. He is a sort of base upgrade to your collection. You're not going to use him in everything, but a lot of things will want you to have him, and his general utility, both as a, you know, a two-drop that you're just fine to play out, uh, Professor X counter, a way to win games where there are locations that are locked off, the general threat of your opponent having to play around what if they move Jeff to every location on the final turn of the game. He is one of the best cards in Marvel Snap. He is almost certainly worth picking up in this cache. However, you should look at what else is in the cache. Red Guardian, a 3-3 with an honor availability that removes the text and gives minus two power to your opponent's lowest power card at any location. Now, I can think of a few generically very strong places for this card to go, and I think the real question is, is it good enough that it kind of just goes everywhere? Because you look at what it targets, right? This is going to hit, I don't know, it'll kill off, you know, a Zabu. It'll kill off a Dracula. It'll kill off a Mobius. Hope Summers often goes in empty locations. It could kill off a Hope Summers. There are a lot of really solid targets for this, but they're sort of timing intensive. You want to be hitting this before your opponent can protect it, right? If they play the Hope Summers and then they play like Jeff Kitty, you know, hitting the Kitty is actually pretty good, but you were really aiming for the Hope, right? You don't really want to be able to... This is not a card that you're like overly happy playing on the final turn of the game unless you know that it's going to hit something unless you know that that thing is not going to be protected. Like, you know, a Dracula, right? Like, this card absolutely dumpsters the card Dracula specifically, turning it off entirely, making it an entire net negative, and probably winning you that matchup, because they are likely counting on it. However, outside of Dracula, this card very often wants to be played on curve. They play a Zabu. You play a Red Guardian. They no longer have access to the Zabu. Like, you need to do that stuff as it happens. And so... I'm interested to see how this card plays out, because to me, it reads 3-5, upside, sometimes it wins you the game. And that means I think it's probably a pretty good card. The question is, does it read a little bit too boring for people to pick it up and play? I personally think that this is a powerful card, but I'm interested to see how this lands with other people, and I'm interested to see how this lands with me once I actually get the chance to play it. Because when I look at it, I read it, I'm like, that's a powerful interactive tool. It's effectively a 3-5 with upside, and the upside is really strong when it hits. But what deck is wanting a 3-5 right now? And I think that's sort of the question. Is this card going to carve out its own niche? Is it going to be like, I have to put this in, you know, a bunch of different decks. This is a really good card. I am required to play it. Or... Is it going to be like when Ghost went to 3-5 and saw play in like 20% of Sarah decks? It's going to be a card that you see. The question is how often you see it and how good it is when you do. I'm interested in this card pretty significantly. Like I think about it like, all right, you know, there's a slot in Loki for this maybe. There's a, definitely a slot in Sarah for this. There are spaces you can want to play this card. I totally get that and I think I will play it in those spots. I am interested to figure out if it makes it beyond the tech card niche, right? That's what I want to find out. If this card just ends up generally applicable and playable, because I think there is a possibility for that. Lady Deathstrike is not a card that is worth opening caches for, as sorry as that makes me to say. And I think this is actually a card that's like a genuine balance problem in how she is designed, which is what I mean by that is whenever you change any number on this card, she gets either way stronger or way weaker. And because her ability is tied to her power, there's no real way to balance her outside of changing numbers. And so you either just keep making her strong until she's really strong, or you keep her where she is, where she's doing very little. 
Now, this is a card that has seen some play recently, like destroys a really good deck and it has an open tech slot. And if people are expecting Shang-Chi, you can play Lady Deathstrike. I've got nothing against that. It's totally fine. But outside of that effective usage of it, which happens, I don't know, probably like once every two months, you're like, oh, I can play Destroy with this card. And then the rest of the time, it's just not doing anything. That's pretty much been the Lady Deathstrike uh, sort of cycle for me. I do not think this is a card that is worth opening for. I honestly wonder if this is a card that they're going to have to revisit at some point because the fact that its ability is tied to its power means that there's no real effective balance levers. It's either going to be really strong or really weak. People talk about like moving it to four and it's like, okay, you moved it to four. Is it going to be good there or is it going to be bad there? That's entirely dependent on the numbers on the card. This card is all numbers and there's no real ability to like mess around with anything else about it. And I think that is a frustrating design uh, to think about. High Evolutionary is a card that is likely to be worth having for most players. However, it's likely never going to be like, you know, tier one best deck High Evo. I think those days are over. Right now, my interpretation of High Evolutionary is that it is just the best budget deck for most people. You can put together something that is reasonably competitive with High Evolutionary and Series 1, 2, and 3 cards. And maybe not even all Series 1, 2, and 3 cards. Like, maybe you can do it with High Evo in Series 2 and you still end up having something real because effectively what high evolutionary does is take a couple of those series one and two cards and make them competitive with the best cards in the game cards like evo cyclops evo abomination to some degree evo hulk these are cards that are competitive with the best of the best at the top end high evolutionaries purchase facilitates you early on having cards that are extremely good and that means that it is one of the best budget pickups you can possibly make in marvel snap because when you think about what thanos is Thanos is a deck that, yes, you can get the card Thanos, but you also need, you know, five other Series 5s. If that's out of reach for you, you can pick up High Evo. You maybe need one or two Series 4 or 5s, maybe. You can probably do something pretty reasonable without any of them, and that is what makes High Evo such a great budget card. To me, White Widow is the scariest card of the season. This is a 2-2 that adds a Widow's Kiss to your opponent's side of the board. Widow's Kiss is a 0-0 with an ongoing ability that says, this card gets minus four power until you fill up the location it is in. I effectively look at this card as sort of reverse lizard. This is a 2-6 that becomes a 2-2 when they fill up the lane. And then the real thing that'll make this worth evaluating in a different context than lizard is, it clogs your opponent. And you can look at that as both an upside or a downside. Obviously it's an upside because it clogs, it's a downside because it makes it easier for them to fill up the lane and make this a 2-2 instead of a 2-6. I also think that there are some unique locations where this card is going to be, like, absolutely dominant. Uh, in cards, uh, locations like Asgard, to get those two cards, like, it's just really hard. Like, you're going to basically say, fill up this lane or I'm going to get these two cards. Uh, Eternity Range, these are just, like, it's a big two-drop, a big priority swing early. If you're doing priority-based gaming, this is the kind of card that matters a lot. Maybe even if you're trying like super giant type stuff, right? Like you are a super giant gamer. This is one of the biggest just two drops you can slap down. This is effectively playing a Maximus on turn two without the downside hitting right then. It's really good for stuff like that. I think the other thing I'm worried about though, and this is a specific dynamic that I think this card may have, is that you can just like play it out in lanes when you're expecting your opponent to go to three. And you can just like very freely just be like, oh, I'll put this there. And then if it doesn't, if they don't fill up that the third lane, it's fine. But like the upside is they just have a totally clogged lane. That kind of stuff is really scary to me. Like if your opponent, you know, oh, they're playing a third card here for whatever location reason, right? Like some locations want you to do that. Boom, clogged, game's probably over. And the ability to just like free roll that, like just like have, okay, yes, this is a good priority card early in the game, sure. But when it's not being a good priority card, it is locking lanes down. And I think that kind of stuff is pretty scary to me because it's like, I find it, this is a card that like, I don't know if it has a home necessarily, but if it finds a good home, I'm terrified. Like <laughs> once people figure out how to make this card uh, be insane, I'm, I'm horrified. Like imagine this on, I don't know, cloning vats, right? <laughs> like. What do you do about that? You just kind of sit there and get clogged on and die, right? Like, I, I'm very glad that this exists now 
when destroy is really strong because if this does become good some kind of clog deck destroy is gonna need to keep that kind of stuff in check alongside her in the caches are snow guard a loki core card a card that i think mostly if not exclusively sees play in loki if you plan on playing loki you should pick up snow guard if you do not plan on playing loki you should not pick up snow guard that's basically all i actually need to say about this this is a loki card that's it Nico Minoru is a flexible and powerful card whose presence is key to at least two of the top five decks at the time I'm recording this. It's a key card in Phoenix Force and a key card in Destroy. If you plan on playing either of those decks, I would plan on picking up Nico Minoru. I think it's pretty interesting that this card also goes in what was, I would say, described as the bounce archetype. And one of my worries for White Widow specifically is, you know, White Widow Beast. That's pretty scary. We all remember how scary Bounce was when we had three cost Werewolf and two cost Black Widow. I wonder if it can still be that scary with, you know, four cost Werewolf and two cost White Widow. If that does end up happening, I mean, this is a great card to go with White Widow in a deck like that. Like Nico Minoru cloning your White Widow, turning your White Widow into a 1-6. Like that kind of stuff is really strong. She tends to see a lot of play in decks that are leveraging cards like Beast and Falcon to repeat beneficial on uh, on reveal effects. White Widow is an extremely beneficial on reveal effect. Nico Minoru is a card that I think could increase in value with White Widow and also increases in value with White Widow basically no matter what, not just because it's being run with White Widow, but because you run destroy against White Widow decks and Nico is a key card in that. Finally, the big boy cash, Valentina a 2-3 that dis not the discovers it doesn't discover it adds randomly to your hand a six cost card randomly from the pool of six costs in the game giving it minus two cost and minus three power so it ends up being a four cost six cost card so your magneto will be nine power your dr doom will be two power but all the stuff that they do still happens I think there are a lot of good rolls off of this, and I expect this card to, at minimum, be a Loki card, because, you know, obviously you have Quinjet Valentina into the 6-drop. That seems very strong. I think this card is generally going to be pretty good. A 2-3 that can compete with Jeff. Uh, this also sort of goes with Hope Summers things. You go, you know, you play this card into Hope Summers, into having a good 4-drop to play on the Hope Summers, into a 6-drop the turn after. There are going to be games where you go, Valentina, Hope Summers, 6-drop, six 6-drop, six 6-drop. Six that is a thing you're going to be able to do. And I think that that kind of card is going to be quite powerful. This is a card I expect to be very, very strong, just in a generic mid-range type deck, but also in the very specific Loki deck because that's already playing Quinjet. The fact that that deck is already playing Quinjet means that you can play turn three, six drops. Not, I get it, right? Like not every hit from this is good. You get an Arnim Zola in a Loki deck, you're probably not playing that, but you can still get rid of the card if you want. That kind of utility makes this a very dangerous card to me. I think this is going to be a strong card, but weirdly, I don't think it's that out of balance because when you think about what a four drop is in Marvel Snap, a six drop minus three power, that's actually not very far off. Like if Magneto was a four nine with the Magneto effect, that's probably balanced, right? Like that's, you could probably print that card, right? Like when you look at like what a Cull Obsidian is, when you look at what even cards that don't see play, Rescue, Jessica Jones, 4 is not that bad, right? Like, there's a lot of those. And so you start looking at like, all right, I mean, I guess this might be fine. I don't, I don't know. Like, when you look at like the actual four drops that see play, a lot of them just already have 10 power or more. And when you look at, you know, six drops, it's like, all right, you know, I'll get a 4-9 Hulk. That's like, okay, I'll play a 4-9. I'm not mad at playing a 4-9, but it's like, it's not really that far above rate. You know what I mean? Like, this is, because it takes them to four, it, it really sort of raises the question, like, man, look at all these, look at all these six drops, right? Like, all these six drops, if you just, like, took three power off them and made them four, I'm not even sure how good, how many of them would be good. Like, that's a pretty interesting thing. Like, you look at, like, okay, uh, is, is, okay, you have, you have four cost Dr. Doom, right? And he is a two that makes fives. Okay, cool. He's a two that makes fives. It's 12 power for your four cost. Miss Marvel exists. Like, I'm not saying, like, obviously, yes, you could do much dumber stuff with four cost Doctor Doom. You have, like, Absorbing Man, you have Long. I get it, right? I, I, I do. But just on rate, 
And they're really not far off from just what a four drop already is. So I feel like there is something saying like, okay, you know, maybe this isn't that bad, right? Like maybe it's not that bad. It's just like a buff to like Loki is just like pretty good. But like, you know, a two, three that gives you a pretty good card should not be underestimated. Just, I think, I think when I think about the six drops minus, like minus a couple of them, because there are a couple of them are just like, okay, that actually is a problem. Like Red Hulk, for example, is just like, oh man, that's a super high roll, right? But there's also super low rolls like Null or Arnim Zola, right? Like these are cards that are not really good. But the fact that you, our opponent won't know what you get, there's utility with Loki. I expect this card to be quite good. Alongside her in the cache is one of the biggest boys, Blob. But honestly, I've got some things to say about Blob. I've got, I've got a take. And my take is, A, Blob is only a Thanos card. And B... I'm not sure he's, like, that necessary in Thanos anymore. Where it's, like, it really sort of demonstrates, A, that the nerf really did damage him, but, B, like, A, there's a Red Hulk coming out, right? Like, that might actually just be bigger some of the time. Uh, Blob is big and good, but only wins one lane and only gets played in Thanos. And it's, like, okay, I kind of wonder whether what will determine whether this is a good open or not is if Red Hulk can replace Blob and Thanos four weeks before this happens. I'm interested to see what happens. I mean, I guess the other thing that could determine this is like, what if they nuke Thanos out of existence? <laughs> and, then, and then there's just nowhere to play a Blob. So I think this, this looks like a good cash now, but in the month between when I'm recording this and when this cash actually comes out, I would be kind of shocked if some stuff didn't change up. And I think both Red Hulk and a potential Thanos nerf have the uh, real ability, in theory, to displace this card from the only deck it's played in that's actually good. Null, as long as Destroy stays good, is a staple card in it. The Destroy deck is a deck that is very built around the card Null. This is a card that you use in order to get as tall as possible. Being as tall as possible is important to you as a Destroy Gamer because that is the premise of the deck. The deck only really works as long as you are just big brothering all the other decks that are playing smaller game plans. Null is extremely key to making that happen. The fact that Null works with both game plans, you have the X-23 game plan and the Deadpool game plan, is very, very important. With the X-23 game plan, you're accelerating out a Null and you're making him like, you know, mid-20s power. That's obviously very good. With a Deadpool game plan, the Null is going to be a lot bigger, but he's only going to be able to go in one lane unless, of course, you like hybridize the game plans. You get both X-23 and Deadpool, in which case you're just popping off and you do everything you've ever wanted. But a lot of the time, you're only going to be relying on one. And the fact that Null works with both of them is part of why Destroy is so good. This is a very powerful card. It is irreplaceable in the Destroy deck. So there are three caches that stand out to me, and they stand out not because of the new cards, but because of the old cards in them in two of those cases. The first is the cache with Jeff in it, I think is going to be worth picking up because Jeff is almost always worth picking up. The second one is the Red Guardian cache with High Evolutionary in it, and I think that card is going to be worth picking up because of both of those things, right? High Evolutionary is a great budget pickup. Most people will benefit from having it in their collection unless you are so far past needing High Evolutionary that you already have like the entire Thanos deck, all the Series 5s for it, and they don't nerf Thanos, God forbid, right? Like that seems like it's very plausible right now to me. So I think High Evolutionary is should be a big draw to a lot of people. It is kind of a shame that the variant for High Evo in this cache is like so mid compared to the previous High Evo variant, but I guess I won't really talk about that. And of course, finally, I think the Valentina cash is quite good right now, but pending A, whether or not Thanos is still around by the time that comes out, B, whether or not Loki is still around by the time that comes out, and C, whether or not Destroy is still good by the time that comes out. If Valentina's cash were the first cash, I'd be like, snap it off, right? Like that cash, if that came out right now, Loki, Thanos, Destroy, you're getting cards for all of them. It's phenomenal. I would do that a month later, after Red Hulk, and after a month of us sitting on here complaining about Thanos, I have some concerns. I still think it's going to be a good cash, but I think it's likely going to be a good cash on the power of Null and Valentina rather than Blob, because Blob is only a Thanos card. And I feel like if Thanos is still good when that cash comes out, people are going to quit the game. So that's sort of where I'm at with this. 
Uh, as always, I've been KM Best. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. We hit 20K subscribers yesterday. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for making it through this video. I have been KM Best. You have gotten the KM Speculative Boost, and I will see you in the next one.